This is not clear. Yeah, man, sir, you can continue, sir. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Vijay, for such a uh, nice session here um, and your organization. Uh, so thank you for having me again. Um, um, we will continue our session from, uh, from from the last time. I cannot cannot see chat. I see chat now. Okay, so let's start. Uh, as rightly pointed out by Dr. Vijay, um, artificial intelligence has become an interdisciplinary uh, subject or or area of investigation, if you may. So people from computer science, they are, of course, they are actively developing uh, many, many, uh, they are making some serious endeavors, serious attempts. Uh, they are looking at the fundamentals. However, um, people from bioinformatics, mechanical, mechatronics, robotics, uh, electrical engineers, um, instrumentation and control engineers, and textiles, uh, and different, different uh, people from different departments, they are also using or uh, leveraging advantages of neural networks and artificial intelligence for their purposes. Uh, for example, um, uh, people in automatic control, they are looking at deep neural networks uh, in order to approximate the functions, uh, the system uh, behavior, uh, and, 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 and approximate the state space of their system for control design, control synthesis. Uh, people from uh, robotics, they are using uh, deep neural networks within the reinforcement learning work for control design, unsupervised control design. People um, in speech recognition, in, uh, in signal processing, they are looking at uh, they are looking at uh, the signals uh, using Markov chain, Markov models, hidden Markov models, HMMs. Uh, is my voice clear, Dr. Vijay? I have a comment that voice is not clear. Is, is my voice clear to yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'll continue. So everyone uh, is making attempt in in, uh, in their respective fields using deep neural networks. Now, today I'm going to present the uh, one of the um, most, uh, let's say, most famous and uh, which has become most famous uh, and synonymous with deep uh, learning, which is uh, convolutional neural networks. So we will talk about that. Uh, of course, this falls under under computer vision, um, under uh, Im image processing under computer vision. But uh, nowadays, even convolutional neural networks, they are used, uh, they, they are being used in different, different domains like signal processing, feature extraction, uh, fault detection, fault prognostics, robotics, um, um, uh, reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning. In fact, they are using uh, convolutional neural networks uh, as a tool and for transfer learning, for domain adaptation, for uh, gener uh, generative models or universal based um, learning, uh, CNNs uh, in a pretty extensive manner. So today and in my last lecture, that is, I think, uh, day after tomorrow, I will be talking about uh, convolutional neural networks. We will look at the functioning of convolutional neural networks. Uh, I will call convolutional neural networks as covnets, which is easy. That way it's easy for me to call this. Uh, otherwise, it's always uh, complicated. Uh, is it convolution? Is this, uh, 
we get entangled there. So let's not make life complicated. I'll call it covenants. Um, so we will look at the basic functioning and uh, and then we will talk about the uh, uh, I will present you a basic architecture proposed by Jan Lacoon in 1998. And that's where we will end. We are not going to investigate all further architectures which are available. You, through these two lectures, you will have the base of understanding covenants. Uh, and using that basic understanding, you can understand many and almost all other architectures, which are just <clears throat> a variant of the basic covenant that the laynet that I will present. So let's go, uh, let's start this session. And uh, for those who are joining me uh, today, my name is Mayank, uh, Mayank Shekhar Jha, uh, and I'm teaching in Polytech Nancy in uh, France, in University of Lorraine, and I work as a researcher in, uh, in the lab CRAN, which is a center of research of automatic control in Nancy. So let's go ahead. So convolution neural networks or cognates. Right, so to, to understand that, let us uh, remind ourselves of basic concepts of an image. So I'm going to talk about image and I'm going to play with images a lot in these two uh, lectures. So it's, it's very important to understand what is an image. So an image is, uh, Basically, it's a, it's a matrix of numbers. So you see the image here of Abraham Lincoln, which is in fact a collection of matrices, which is a matrix of, of numbers. That's all it is. So in fact, an image is made up of different pixels. And for example, here, the first pixel on the uh, top corner, right-hand side, the left-hand side, top corner, it's a it's a pixel which has a different which has a specific value 157 for example so you can see that this image is basically a matrix of of numbers well if you have a grayscale image if you let's say you have a grayscale image then uh, that means you have one channel of grayscale which means it's a 2d matrix okay just like as it is shown and each pixel that is each box here each of these box has a value which is between 0 and 255. So if you change the value of this uh, box, the color will change. So you can see that a uh, box which has zero value is extremely dark, is, is the darkest. But if you increase the value of, 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 of the box from zero to, let's say, um, uh, let's say 145, which is just on its left hand side, it becomes uh, the, 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 the whitish tint becomes um, very, uh, very uh, clear. And if you increase it further to 37, well, it becomes more white. Uh, could the participant please, please mute uh, Madam Rajita? Could you mute your? Okay, thank you. Um, then 235, you see it is more whitish. So basically, uh, uh, the color of the box depends on the value. So that's what I mean by pixel and its value, right? So, yeah. So number of pixels, they are proportional to image size. So if the image size, you have a certain image size, and uh, the number of pixels that you will have uh, depends on the size of the matrix, right? So, uh, you can have a very slow uh, resolution image and you can uh, if you if you have an image of low resolution it, it means it has uh, a small number of pixels but if you have an image of high resolution let's say five uh, megabyte five mb then there are many matrices that's why it is uh, it it requires more uh, memory right um, so that's the grayscale image. Let's talk about color images. So color images are, uh, are, are similarly based on similar principles, but they have three channels. Uh, they, it's a 3D array. So there are three channels. 
uh, red channel, green channel, and blue channel. So in fact, uh, you can see that uh, color. Just a question, Dr. Vijay, can you see my cursor? Can you see my pointer? Is that okay? Dr. Vijay, can you see my pointer? Yes, sir. Cursor? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so, um, you see that any colorful image is made up of three channels, red channel, um, green channel, blue channel. And each of these channels, they are basically matrices of, 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 of numbers between uh, 0 to 55. Remember, these numbers can be normalized between 0 and 1, which is very good, which is normalization. And that way, you have all the num values between 0 and 1. Uh, right? So, so any image, now this is very important to understand. We are going to talk about these images. So it's very important to understand that any image is built by three layer, any colorful image is built by three layers. First layer, okay, uh, first matrix, second matrix, and third matrix. So that's why any image can be treated as an array. It can be treated as an array of three, mat three uh, matrix. So basically, uh, if you have an image of three channels, you have uh, depth of three layers. If you have four channels, you will have depth of four, uh, four layers. If you have uh, uh, five depth of five channel, you will have five, uh, five uh, layer depth. And width, of course, and height it depends on the size of each uh, size of the image or size of the each layer. So, okay, at any time, if you have any question, uh, you can just post the question in the chat box in the public domain so that I can address them as I keep looking to the chat box. Okay, now, so let's go ahead. Well, in the previous part, we discussed uh, how how the basic neural network functions, how the MLP, multi-layered perceptrons, or fully connected layers, they work. Uh, so let's talk about the drawbacks. Let's talk about the uh, drawbacks. Okay. So what are the drawbacks of existing neural, uh, of the classic, uh, classic neural network that we studied, the feedforward neural networks. Well, if you see, if you take any image, um, you see that you will have basically every uh, from well to learn the image. All the pixels they will be fed, they will be used as input to the neural network. So here x one is perhaps the first box. X2 is perhaps the second box, X3 is here, X4 is here, and like that you go and you feed all the pixels, all these boxes into, into the neural network. So since this is, uh, let's say, a 256, uh, let's say um, uh, an image of uh, low resolution, you have let's say, a 16 by 16 uh, image, grayscale, that means you have 256 boxes. All of these boxes, they are fed into the neural network as features. And of course, uh, you will have an output. So the output uh, will be, remember this output will be multi-class classification because you are trying to classify A, B, C, D in uh, different classes. And uh, this looks like it is B. To me, it looks like it is alphabet B. Um, so uh, neural network will try to understand what this alphabet is and will try to classify. Uh, either it will classify it as A or B or C or D. So you will have 26 classes here. So that's why it's a multi-class uh, output uh, problem, right? Now, so this can be done, but uh, why is it a clumsy process? Why it is not efficient? Because if you just calculate the number of parameters needed to tune for the simple learning, 
well, you will understand that it's a, a, there are a lot of parameters to be trained here. So for one simple calculation of one layer with 100 units, let's say it has 100 uh, neurons, uh, you're going to have 256 inputs, 100 units, which means you will have 25600 input weights, uh, that's almost 25,600 input weights. You will have 100 bias because with each node you will have one bias. And the outputs, of course, you have 26 classes as outputs. So you have 2600 output weights and you have 26 bias, one for each output. So that makes total number of parameters almost 28,326 parameters that must be tuned each time back propagation happens. And that is for only one layer. If you put another layer, it's doubled. So it's just a lot of parameters to learn each time. And that severely affects the learning capability of neural networks. It, uh, it takes a lot of time. Somebody has raised a hand. Uh, uh, could you please ask uh, the question in chat box? Uh, that would be easier for me to answer. So, so, and that is just one layer. So that's a huge disadvantage, right? And nowadays, most of the images, they're high resolution. There are several thousands of pixels, several thousands of inputs. So, I mean, if you have one, B, one megabyte or more than that, which is usually the case, you're just going to have many, many, many boxes like this. This is for a 16 by 16 image, which is very simplistic. So the question here posed is, how is the number of inputs in each layer is decided? How the number of inputs in each layer? Perhaps what, what we mean is how the number of Inputs in each layer. Well, that's the, the inputs are decided by the image, um, the image size. So here the image size is 16 by 16. So you have 256 inputs. If you have an image of uh, 10 by 10, you'll have 100 inputs. And since we are talking about feed forward neural network, each, net, each input is connected to each node. Question is, can we remove outliers? Yes, we can remove outliers, but depends on what kind of outliers we're talking about. Uh, uh, that we can uh, that that we can discuss later on. But outliers here, I don't really understand the uh, context of the outlier. So let's go ahead. Uh, but you can uh, you can. Uh, you can clarify it in the chat box, right? So most of the images are one MB or more. Uh, so there are several hundred layers. So, so there are many number of boxes. This is a 16 by 16. And in uh, one MB, you, you are looking at uh, uh, um, almost 10 times or 100 times of, uh, of uh, boxes. So what it means is that there's a lot of data. There's a, just a lot of data to be, to be learned, to be fed into the neural network. So uh, well, if you have a lot of data, you need a lot of layers and a lot of nodes in each layer. So that the total parameters to train, they become extremely large and the computation becomes intractable, which means it just becomes unfeasible, infeasible and not feasible. And of course, one of the solution is that to regularize the weights that we discussed, we discussed in the previous lecture, regularization technique. Uh, well, you can, in principle, use regularization technique, but it won't lead. It doesn't lead to uh, efficient results because, uh, well, basically, then you are rejecting um, the, the the information, and so there's a, the, the, this trade-off is always there. So it's difficult, and and also it is very difficult to reproduce the same results when you regularize any method uh, to a great extent because essentially you are constraining the its uh, its, its its ability. To learn. Uh, the question here is why the hidden layer is 100 units? Well, the hidden layer is 100 units just because well, I wanted to show an example. That's why. No, nothing, no, no, 
no rational here. It can be 10 units. If it works well for you, it's fine. Uh, um, I am just taking 100 units because I wanted to give this example. That's all. Uh, it depends on uh, the performance that you will have. If you are having uh, overfitting with 100 units, then perhaps you need to try with 10 units first, uh, then go to 50 units. And then perhaps if you're, if you're getting underfitting, you can go to 160, 70 units. And maybe at 70 units, you will see that you are having no underfitting and no overfitting. And perhaps at 100 units, you're having 100 fitting. So indeed, 100 units will not be a good choice. But I just uh, assume here that at 100 units, you are not having underfitting as well as overfitting. Okay. Uh, the other question is the inputs with the same values for different layers. Right. I don't understand that. Perhaps we can discuss at the end of the class. So strong regularization is needed, difficult and uh, little reproducibility. That's, that's your first drawback. The second drawback is that uh, you, you see you have an object, let's say B. If you tilt it a little bit, if you change your data source a little bit, uh, then uh, uh, you know the, 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 the image, I mean, you, you, you will want that your neural network should detect the image uh, in similar fashion. I mean, change, a, change an image a little bit, and if your neural network is not able to identify it, well, it's not a good scenario. It's not a good thing. So your neural network should, should be able to recognize your data your, regardless of its orientation. So in fact, the orientation and location of the object in an image should have little influence over getting detected. But this is not true with previous neural networks that we saw, like multilayer perceptrons or ANNs. Why? Because they are sensitive to uh, scaling, shifting, other distortions, and they also um, uh, they, 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 the influence of surroundings, the global context of the image. Uh, uh, is taken into account during, I mean, the, the, the surroundings, they have a huge influence over, over, the, over the learning of neural network. That's because, well, you can see, uh, uh, you can see here that you have an image. Uh, if you move it a little bit, well, you are changing the value of boxes. So before this box had certain, um, certain value, it was uh, white, but now it is this box, which is uh, which is which is which is uh, black and not white. So in fact, if you are uh, giving your information in uh, uh, in this sense, in this way, uh, each time your neural network will change its understanding based on the orientation of the same image. So for neural network, if you change this B a little bit, if you change it, if you make it tilted. A little bit. It's another image. It's a new image. So it's trying to understand it again from you know from uh, um, like a, like it's a new image. It doesn't take into account the basic features of the image, like the curves or let's say it doesn't try to understand. Oh, it has this straight line followed by two curves. So maybe it is R or maybe it is B or maybe it is D. Uh, so on and so forth. So for the neural network, it's for neural network, this image that you see on the left hand side and this image that it saw before, they are two completely two well, very different images. And that's not a good thing because, because you uh, because you will have to train the neural network separately for this image, which is not good. So it has a high variance to scaling, shifting, and distortions, and also the influence of surroundings. Uh, the topology of the data is also ignored, and what it means is that the basic distribution, the inherent distribution of, uh, of the data is not learned. Uh, the neural network is not able to learn what are the um, basic characteristics and features, right? Uh, okay, so having said that, let's continue. Oh. So in fact, any good uh, learning, uh, a good efficient neural network must avoid the parameter explosion. 
okay in face of large inputs it must be able to identify the object uh, and should be invariant to scaling shifting other orientations the object should be identif uh, identif uh, fiable, identifiable in any location orientation okay so if you have your a uh, the alphabet a in this way and if you tilt it a little bit or if you make it small or if you uh, make it tilted or you know distort it a little bit here and there well uh, or, or change its placement in the image it should not have much influence on the outcome and only the local information about the object should be sufficient so those are the drawbacks now in face of these drawbacks let's start with the convolution neural networks uh, why they are powerful and how they are powerful so the motivation well it was proposed by I, i'm going to go through this very fast because um, because we have less time so these were uh, this, uh, they were invented by Andrew Kuhn and Joshua Vigio uh, while he was a student. Um, Jan Le Kuhn was a student of Joshua Vigio in 1995. And uh, they were proposed a special kind of multi layer networks inspired by our brain mechanism, how we understand, uh, how we understand shapes, this is by how we, um, how we understand different features. So here the under, idea is to understand the basic attributes of the information so your information can have uh, different attributes like let's say here you have a snow leopard and uh, the snow leopard has a tail so um, well, uh, the idea is to understand to learn the basic attributes from similar kinds of data so, so it doesn't matter if it's a snow leopard, it doesn't matter if it's a cheetah or a desert or, or, or Sahara, uh, Sahara leopard. Um, uh, the idea is to construct a neural network which is able to detect uh, the tail of any, any cat. It can be a leopard, it can be a cat, it can be uh, a snow leopard, it can be a lion or uh, not lion but belonging to the same family. Uh, the idea is to capture the attributes such as the shape uh, using the shape size orientation and color so the I, so the idea is to capture the data in such a way that um, uh, you know uh, the learning of neural network uh, is done using basic uh, is done using basic features so in fact the idea is to construct a tail detector uh, irrespective of, uh, of, 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 uh, of 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 the let's say animal or i mean it, uh, i mean irrespective of um, the the kind of animal that we are looking at um, we are still able uh, we, uh, here the idea is to capture or learn the basic attributes right um okay so let's go ahead so continuing the same example here as we said the intuition is to understand the inherent data distribution and um uh use that to to understand the the other features so using only the local information and not the whole global information in order to extract the topological properties. So here you see different cats and leopard. This is a snow leopard. Um, well, the idea is to learn. Can we, can we learn uh, these attributes uh, using only the local information? And also the idea is to implicitly extract the re relevant features. Um, which features are relevant? Well, that's a question. And of course, then the challenge is to understand the new data, the unseen data, using these learned attributes. That is, okay, um, we understand that these are the eyes, these are the eyes, these are the eyes, these are the eyes. If we understand that these are eyes of a snow leopard, when the eyes of a cat uh, is given, can we still uh, classify the cat as uh, as an animal or not? 
or in the cat family or not? That's the question. So the question is more, uh, more large here. It's a general question. Can we learn the higher level attributes as well as the lower level attributes uh, based on the, uh, based on the uh, local information? So if you have to, uh, if you have to bring it in the context of, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the alphabet that we saw, so instead of learning exactly how the alphabet is, e, uh, alphabet is, we are trying to learn the um, uh, the basic attributes. That is basic shapes. Let's say we are trying to learn uh, this particular shape, which is a curve here. So a, a convolutional neural network will extract this attribute. It will also uh, uh, extract the other features such as this particular curve or this particular this particular feature which it will uh, which is also an interesting attribute it will try to extract different features which are outstanding which are pertinent which are uh, characteristic of the data in order to construct in order to identify or uh, in order to characterize a new data so a few examples are like like you can have different, you can have B written in different ways, but um, it will not change the basic attributes. You will always have two curves uh, and one straight line in a B. So that's not going to change. So if the neural network is unable to understand that, then, then it is able to classify B in different shapes, in different orientations as B and not as A. So examples in real life, like a door is always rectangular. A ship has a, has a characteristic shape. A ship doesn't have a shape like an aeroplane, but like a ship. And a car will all, always has four wheels and a typical shape. It doesn't have a shape of, 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 a, of a motorbike, for example. So if neural network is able to understand the basic attributes, it's able to understand uh, such data. Okay, so let's let's talk about the intuition. So we talked about the general attributes. Let's see how it is done. So the first shape, first shape is here. So uh, what the intuition is that we are going to use an image kernel to extract relevant features from the image. So what's a kernel? A kernel is just like a filter. So the kernel will examine will to different parts of the image and will extract a different, uh, the relevant features and similar operations will be performed further on. So, um, so the idea is to use the image kernel to extract the uh, relevant features from the image and basically image kernel is image matrix so you're trying to well it's, it's it's image kernel is basically an image matrix which is trying to learn uh, uh, learn the uh, appropriate features in, in some way the, the, the idea is to use successive training in order to learn the weights of this filter. So if you are able to learn how, how the filter, if you are able to learn, um, uh, if you are able to learn the exact attributes, well, let, let's put it this way. If you are able to learn the function of the filter in in an accurate way, then in fact, you are learning the attributes on which this filter is, 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 is uh, the attributes that this filter is covering is sensitive to that. That's one way to put it. So let's, let's see some examples. Here we have shape one, which is being extracted by a filter shape two extracted by a filter. 
and our objective will be to learn the filter as accurately as possible. So some examples I've taken from the blogs um, uh, on deep learning with their uh, references being given in the slides. So here you see the hub and using a simple edge detector, we are able to understand how, where the edges are. So here you can see uh, the edges are shown in white and rest all of it is in black. So this is done using an edge detector. So what's an edge detector? Edge detector is let's say just a filter which has uh, edges and wherever uh, wherever you apply this filter to, it will uh, give results which are uh, only positive, edges are there and uh, zero edges are not there. So it's a basic image filter. A similar example here you see, uh, you have an input and the uh, and, 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 uh, the filter in red is able to classify uh, the first uh, 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 different edges and uh, image and the filter in red is able to uh, identify different kinds of uh, different kinds of edges so that's 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 the whole idea um, so the so the so the idea is to learn the ways of these images now this can also be used in different uh, domains such as uh, uh, electronics and uh, such as electrical because there you have uh, signals and signals they have uh, different properties so you can by constructing different kinds of kernels or filters, you can be extracting uh, the features in fact this idea of convolution uh, convolutional filters they, they have actually come from uh, electrical so the idea is not very different from what uh, we use in signal processing and low pass filter or high pass filter so this is like a low pass filter where it is trying to extract all um, um, only the rectangular images right uh, only the rectangular shape it's like a filter we'll see its uh, correspondence those of you uh, who are from electrical background will find the similarity uh, very intuitive. So, so if this can be done with one filter, why not to uh, why not to use multiple kernels to extract a set of features expected from the object, right? So if we, this can be done with one filter, why not to like stack two, three filters or maybe sets of filters to extract a set of features from the data. So that's the whole idea. So the intuition is to uh, construct uh, a stacked filters, one filter followed by another filter, followed by another filter in order to uh, extract a set of features. But of course, is that feasible? We don't know. We have to ask. Uh, the question is how to construct these filters. Uh, edge detection, for example, it's, it is simple. Uh, but for the other features, it is not so possible. Even edge detection is not so obvious. You don't know how, what kind of uh, filter you must choose or you must create. You don't know. We don't know in advance what kind of filters we must choose. So, if we don't know what kind of filters we must choose, well, obviously, we do. We must learn uh, how. Uh, what are the way we must learn? Uh, what are these filters? And learning filters is like learning the weights. So, by learning the weights of filters, you are learning. Uh, you are you are learning the uh, you are learning the kernel. Okay. Right. Do we have some questions by now? I'm taking a small pause here. Do we have some questions? Uh, you can post your question in the chat box if you want.
Okay, so let's go ahead. Right. So the intuition is that let's learn the image kernels, these features, uh, which are able to extract features. And that is done using the convolution operation. And so what is convolution and how it is done? We are going to look at it. So those who of you who are coming from electro electrical background or controls background, signal processing background, you will appreciate the fact that convolution uh, was invented not in 1991, but way uh, before that. So convolution operation is nothing but, it's just, it has origin in signal processing and convolution is just uh, the process of producing a third signal from, from two signals uh, by, through overlapping, uh, by overlapping one signal over the other and by extracting, by, by seeing the degree of similarity between the two signals. So in convolution here, uh, we are overlapping x, uh, x at instant tau and y at instant t minus tau and we are basically looking at the similarity between these two signals and we are making a summation of it that's all that's what convolution is and basically convolution uh, idea has has as uh, as has, has, has give uh, has is uh, you know the basis of the whole uh, uh, whole uh, signal processing of linear systems followed by of course uh, different other kinds of systems. So the, the, they are idealistic in nature, but that's how we have the system response. We have the, um, we have the uh, impulse response uh, and by, by convolating the impulse response uh, with the input, we get the system response, right? So basically convolution is uh, nothing but seeing the similarity between between the signals uh, in some way or the other in broad sense so i will not go much into details but in fact every every system output is uh, defined using the concept of convolution so all those of you who are teaching in uh, second or third year uh, including myself we use these concepts uh, for to do in the signal processing uh, domain so so that's the idea behind signal uh, convolution. And uh, basically it's the same process. It's exactly the same. I want you to appreciate the fact that uh, convolution is, is in some sense overlapping of, of a filter, of a filter, let's say over the signal and extracting the matching characteristics. So let's say here you have uh, the left-hand side figure is convoluted with the right hand side figure. So it tries to extract uh, the similar uh, features in the bigger image. And, and the output is uh, the image which has, um, which has, which has the highest similarity. Okay. Uh, uh, you have the signal with uh, all overlapping uh, uh, common characteristics, right? Is that clear for everyone? Do we have any questions still here? So in fact, uh, convolution, it extracts a weighted feature, okay? So it's a weighted feature. Now it's a similar uh, concept here. Uh, I will not go much into details, but you can see uh, animation. If it tries to, it, here, what we are trying to do is the green curve is the output of the convolution between red and blue. So once you will see, once the blue curve, it overlaps completely on red, you have maximum output because basically that's when it matches completely with the shape of red. So you're trying to match the similarity. Now, I assume that it's okay for everyone. You have got the question. So let's go ahead. Convolution. So now in the image processing context, well, this was rediscovered in 1991. I would say it was uh, uh, reformulated 
in the con in the neural network uh, context uh, by Jan de Kuhn under the supervision of Joshua Benjio. And the idea was to then um, take the image and con and, uh, and convolve it with uh, with uh, image kernels, okay, and uh, and pass through the threshold to see what kind of uh, to pass through the threshold to see uh, if if the features of the picture were matching with the features of 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 the filter or not. So if you do that, what's happening is that. So if you do if you do that, then what uh, then what's happening is that uh, we are basically passing the different features through a threshold, and if the feature in the figure matches with the feature in the convolution filter, then it passes through the threshold. If it doesn't match, then it doesn't pass through the threshold, right? So that's what it is. So if you have let's say an edge detector here, you have straight line. So if it goes through this part of the straight line, well, it will pass through the threshold. If it goes through this part, it will not pass through the threshold. So what you will get is essentially, well, this particular this straight line, and you'll perhaps get this particular line because this is also straight in some way, right? So that's 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 the idea. Okay. Is my voice clear to everyone? Is that okay? Do we have some questions? Is it too complicated for everyone? Or... Uh, sir, sir, one question is there. Yeah. Yes, regarding filter, sir, can you, uh, I mean, how will decide particular kind of uh, filter based on seeing this image? Oh, so you cannot. We discussed this. You cannot, You well, usually, you cannot decide the best filter so the best filter has to be learned uh, and and that's what we do using uh, convolution neural network we learn a set of filters which is most appropriate which is most suitable given the data so here you have uh, the image b well uh, you can you can use some edge detector uh, but I cannot say that it's the best filter because, well, uh, how do I how do I know? It just depends on the output that is given. So the whole idea is to learn the best filter. In fact, uh, 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 using convolutional neural network. So co to come to your question, we are trying to learn the best filter. We are trying to learn the best filter. Here, just for example, I have shown minus one minus one minus one zero 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 one 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 but what i can do during my learning what i will do is i will put weights here i'll put weight one weight two weight three weight four weight five weight six weight seven weight eight weight nine and i'll try to learn it and if really if really this is my best answer if really this is my best filter then i will have weight one equals minus one I'll have weight two equals zero, weight three equals one, so on and so forth. And that depends on the training procedure as well as the data. Okay. So let's go ahead. Um, so let's go back to our CNN's domain. And here to formalize the problem, well, the uh, the images they are considered as uh, as four D tensors. Okay. And I'm not going to go in much into details here. Uh, I'll just go the overview, uh, give the overview. So in fact, any position can be considered at, at uh, i and j, any position. And um, then, uh, then basically you have, uh, so let's, let's, let's consider uh, hidden layers as. Uh, Excuse me, sir. The array. Yeah, is there a question? Y yes, sir. I'm having a question. Yeah. Uh, so, so, what would be the depth of a filter? Like, generally, what would be the depth of a filter uh, for this convolution network? Like, what will be the maximum and minimum value of this depth? Oh, 
Uh, no, I don't know. The, I mean, there's no limit. Uh, the maximum depth it depends on the uh, the complexity of your data. So the Alexia, which is uh, well, the Alexia, which uh, uh, was by Amazon for, for for voice recognition, it has it is trained using several layers. I mean, I think hundreds of thousands layers of uh, of, of deep neural networks. So the, I mean, it's a very complicated. Uh, it, I mean, this this depends on the um, the data, and also it depends on uh, on 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 the richness of data, and follows the same argument we gave in last lecture uh, with overfitting, cross validation, and so on and so forth. There's no definitive answer there. Hope that answers the question. So let's go ahead. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now we have dense layers. So we can construct. We can consider any image at any position i and j. Uh, and well, uh, uh, let, let's not go into this. Uh, let me just say that here you have a, a kernel. Okay, around that image, around that position i and j, with weights. And you have the position of the image itself. And now, what you, what the idea is to use this kernel to go around this image across all A and all B. So you start from the width A and let's say depth B and go all across this image. So that's what we are doing here uh, to give you a picture, uh, to give you a simulation. Uh, what we are doing is that we take one uh, one position I. And uh, we start from there. Let's say we start from here, and we go across all the length and breadth of the image. as results in accordance with the similarity of the filter with the image okay is that clear for everyone so we are this process is basically uh, basically similar to saying that well we are making a, we are uh, uh, we are uh, you know we are using this filter and we are covering, we are basically doing this process over the whole of the image. Right. Now, once we do that, as output we get, uh, we get the output uh, we get uh, is the reflection of the similarity between the image and the features of the so the question is here, coming back to this uh, previous question, we don't know the weights. So the idea is to learn the weights of the filter in such a way that, uh, that it corresponds to a characteristic feature of the image. Let's go ahead. So we do the same here. The same thing is being done on this particular image. Um, uh, it is. It goes to uh, all expands all lengths and breadths of the image and outputs the uh, result. Well, that's uh, that's an easy case if you know how the filter is constructed. Now, well, we talked about two deficiencies before. So, just for information, I'll not go much details here. But in, for information, I have put that in fact. Here we are invoking the translation invariance, where we are saying that um, uh, we, are, we are saying that the weights they are all the uh, same, um, uh, irrespective of 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 of, uh, of, of, of exposition, right? And um, in this way, all neurons they are able to detect the same feature at different positions in the image, right? So we say that the weights they they do not depend on the position of the object. So we are in fact making it uh, robust to, uh, to, to, to the translation variance. 
And we also invoke locality. We said that the detection ability should not depend on uh, the context of the image. It should it should only depend on the local uh, local features. So um, uh, we should be able to look in proximity and not very far. So in fact, we, we constrain the size of the image uh, of kernel filter. Sorry. So we say that um, here uh, we have first uh, weights are the same, but we also constrain. We say that the width of a should be more than some particular uh, so some particular size. And that way, uh, that way uh, should not be more than some particular size. So that way, uh, what happens is that we are only looking at this small area here. If you look in this, um, if you look in this uh, image animation, it's just looking at this small box here. Then it looks at small box here, no small box here, small box here. It doesn't look at the whole a huge box at one time, right? So that's the idea. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's look at the convolution process itself in details. How does this happen? Um, so let, let, let's look at an example. Right, so So we have a six by six image, okay? Let's say this is our example, six by six image, and we have two filters. Let's say we know the weights of our filters. So what, what will be the convolution? The convolution uh, uh, routine will use this to go through all of the image, okay? And output the result. And similarly, let's say we have another filter with another set of features. And let's say we know the weights of the filter. So how will this convolution look like? So let's address that point. What's gonna happen is that this filter is going, going, to, is going to go through each hole of the image, uh, one stride per, per step. So strides are known as the, the, the number of, uh, this is uh, the uh, stride is basically the, uh, the step taken uh, at, at each uh, at each uh, the, the length of the step at uh, each time okay at each iteration or at each convolution operation so in the first step here in the first step here we have our kernel which is overlapping with this part so tell me what's the result. Well, the results is pretty easy. Here you can see one is multiplied with one plus zero multiplied with minus one, zero multiplied with minus one. And you, you do summation of all, all of this. Zero with minus one is zero. One with one is one. Zero with minus zero. And in this fashion, you add all of this and you get the result three because it's one plus one plus one. Now, if you do the same here, you'll get well, zero, 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 that's fine. Here, one with minus one is minus one. Zero with, well, rest is zero. Here, one with minus one is minus one. So it becomes minus two. And one with one is one. So minus two plus one is minus one. So the result is minus one. Is that clear for everyone? If it's not clear for anyone, please write N in the chat box. So far, so good. Everyone understood? Uh, well, either everyone is sleeping or they have understood. This is pretty clear. Very well. So, so please, again, the, there's a, a comment. So yeah, let, let me go through it again. So we have the image kernel. Uh, starting from the left top, uh, left most, uh, left most part. Uh, so uh, let's go element wise. This is element wise multiplication plus uh, summation of all uh, the product uh, summation of all the products. So basically, one multiplied with one is one, and rest here is zero. Here 
one in the center multiplies with one, that becomes one again. And uh, the rest is zero, and one multiplies with one, that becomes one again. So you add one plus one plus one, that becomes three. In the similar way, if you do with this, you get minus one. If you see here, oh, this is zero, this is zero, here one multiplies with minus one, so that is minus one. One with minus one is minus one. One with minus one is minus one. So it becomes minus three, in fact, because it's minus one plus minus one, minus one plus minus one, so minus one. So it becomes minus three. So that gives you a weighted sum of, 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 of the filter and the image. Uh, that's, that's the whole thing. So we, let's, so we do the same each time. And please see, each time we are advancing by the length of one. So when we are translating in the uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, translating breadthwise, uh, it's the, the length of stride is one. Okay, that's why we call the stride as one, and then we go down by one. That's why we call stride as one. Then again one, like that. We go through all across the image, and we calculate, and we calculate uh, the result which becomes something like this. So this is the featured map. This is your feature map. So we convolve through all the sites and we get a uh, slide over all the spatial locations and uh, we, cons we construct the featured map. So this is the output that we get is feature map. Please remember that. So that's a straightforward calculation of a feature map with respect to filter one. Now, we can do the same with filter two using the same image, right? So if you do that, it's going to be a similar feature and we are going to have another feature map. So we have a feature map with respect to filter one. We are going to have a feature map with respect to filter two. And each filter detects a small, each filter is able to detect a small feature. That's the whole deal. Okay. So the question is, how are the filter values decided? Well, it is not. Here, I have just taken an example. I assume that I know the filter values. They Usually, I don't know. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to learn the weights. I'm going to learn the value of these, uh, of these filters. And that's the whole, that, is the whole, uh, that is the whole idea behind convolution neural networks. So I'm just explaining that if I know these weights, how will I how uh, will I produce the next result? How will I uh, do the convolution? But um, uh, in the learning, uh, for in the, the problem in learning is that we don't know the optimal values of this filter, and using back propagation, using back propagation, we will learn the weights of these filters. And uh, ideally, before we will start with, let's say, some initial value, we will start with zero here, and it will adapt itself. It will become zero, minus 0 0.1, minus 0 0.2, and then finally it will become minus one at the end of training. So that's the whole idea. So let's go ahead. Is that clear for, for everyone? If it's not clear, please write N. Great. So, so far, so good. Let's go ahead. Uh, well, it's not clear. So, could you ask me the question, Mr. Kunal, please, in, in, in voice? Could you ask the question, Mr. Kunal, in voice? Okay. Uh, so, well, the whole idea is that I am explaining you the convolution process. That if you have the image and if you have a filter, given filter, how, what is the result of convolution? But in the learning problem, we do not know the exact value of these weights. And the learning problem is that we have to learn the weights of the filter. Okay? So, if we do not know the exact values, we can start with some zero initial value and through back propagation that we saw earlier, 
lecture uh, we uh, we can adapt we can change modify the weights so that they uh, converge to the most optimal weight uh, that is one in this case minus one here minus one here and so and so forth okay okay there's a comment clearly understood very well thank you so let's go ahead so the idea here was to understand the convolution output with respect to each filter so each filter uh, results uh, uh, leads to an output which is feature map okay so this is the, the behind is the feature map with respect to filter one and then the next feature map is with respect to filter two so what this actually means is that uh, well two images of four by four metrics is produced right so from a six image, six by six image, we have two images of four by four. So that's that's wonderful because we are able to reduce the size of image and we are able to extract the most useful features, right? In fact, we are able to extract the features which is common between filter one and image in the first feature map. And we are able to extract the features which is common to filter two and the image in the second feature map, right? So that is great because remember, we, 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 we said that the image size, it affects the learning capability. So by reducing the image size, we are reducing the amount of data uh, to be handled at each step. And at the same time, we are extracting features which are common between the given filter and the image, a given filter and the image. And that is wonderful because now uh, your problem is to just design this filter appropriately. And if you know those exact filters, that's perfect. But if you don't know, then the idea is to learn those filters by using weight uh, back propagation, right? So, is that clear for everyone? I'll give myself a break of 20 seconds and drink some water. Right, in this time, if you have some questions, you can just write it in the chat box or if you have some remarks or comments. Great. So let's go ahead. So if you are, if you are okay with this, then let's go ahead. So this concept can be generalized from a large image getting a small image uh, can be generalized. And um, uh, if you have H by uh, W image, well, by using a two-dimensional feature you can uh, well, well this is just an example here uh, for an edge detection uh, using an edge detection kernel um, you can extract the edges right so let's just go through it and let's see what it leads to it leads to some some edges you can see that clearly the edges the change in the color they are identified uh, at different edges right but it's difficult to, so the idea here is to, to, to understand completely that uh, the filters, they are able to extract uh, features from the image, but having a knowledge of such filters is extremely difficult, is extremely, uh, uh, is, is near to impossible. So, so in fact, it is difficult to handcraft such filters and thus filter kernel weights must be learned. And that's the message here, right? So, so let's, let's see how this can be learned. Um, so we saw 
in the previous slide that output shape is determined by the shape of input and convolutional kernel window. Uh, so that's it depends on the size of the image as well as the size of the filter. So in fact, in general, if you have nh, uh, if you have height of uh, the, the the height of the, uh, the the result is in fact height of the uh, image minus height of the kernel plus one times height of uh, the, the width of the image minus width of the kernel plus one okay so when you have six by six and um, uh, three by three a kernel then you have six minus three plus one which is four by four of, of result okay so and and then to understand this concept a little more further uh, let's let's uh, let's understand what padding is so in fact multiple layers of convolution it can reduce the information available at the boundary, right? So it can reduce the um, uh, it, it can reduce the, um, uh, the 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 size of the image, and um, uh, I think those who are in electrical engineering will appreciate the uh, zero padding uh, method, which uh, which exists in signal processing, where uh, we try to increase the resolution by of the signal by adding zeros. Uh, in the FFT domain, so that's 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 what it is. So those who are studying electrical engineering, who are working with FFT and uh, other uh, tools, uh, signal processing tools, you would know what zero padding is, and that's the whole idea here also. Because by adding zero, you are not really changing the information. You are not adding any value to the information. So, but what you are doing is you are changing the you are increasing the resolution because now. Um, now you are preventing the problem uh, where the information is getting reduced at the boundary. So adding zeros around the edges such as, such as such that multiple convolution operation does not lead to information loss and pixels are added around the edges and these pixels are zero in value. Okay. That's a great comment. Truly, sir, I have understood the uh, first time convolution very well. Well, that, that, that makes me happy. And every pixel will have will be zero. That's true. Um, okay, so there are also comments like uh, clearly understood. So that's very good. Okay, so but in practice, so that's um, that that happens in, in, in principle, that's the case. But in practice, uh, what we do is that uh, we choose the kernel dimensions as odd numbers. Uh, why do we do that? Because remember, the output result is going to be uh, the image size minus uh, minus the uh, the kernel kernel size, kernel height plus padding, right? Plus one. So if you keep your padding dimensions as even, if p is even, then and if k is odd. Uh, sorry, if k is odd, then p is going to be even, right? So that's how it works. You choose your kernel as odd number, and that will make p even. And if p is even, then you can distribute it equally on each side, right? Or padding dimensions would be k minus 1 by 2. So if you choose your k as odd, your padding dimension would be uh, would be um, would be easily uh, distributable on either side. Okay, so that's that's how it works. That's how uh, that's how it works. Okay, is that okay for everyone? So that's your padding right there. Okay. Uh, so let's 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 just go through. So once this is clear, padding and stride. Let's go through the, the overall procedure again. So we have an image and stride is one. So one stride means every time we are taking just one step. Okay, goes through the image and you generate your feature map. Now, if you take, if you choose stride as two, then what's gonna happen is that you will take two steps at one time. So when you are moving horizontally, you are um, you are taking two you are leaving two boxes at one time okay 
and if you are going down vertically then you are leaving two boxes also each time okay and that's where and your feature map is generated which is 3 by 3 which takes into account the stride also so this is the general formula where output size depends on uh, the size of image size of kernel as well as padding and the number of stretch right now if you increase the stride then you cannot apply a 3 by 3 filter right because if you increase uh, let's say if you uh, uh, if you don't want to do it with two but if you want to do it with three then you can't you cannot apply a three by three filter it does not fit right um, because here you have three and if you leave three and one two three well it won't fit the filter won't put fit um, before going ahead i have i see a question why convolution always uses odd numbers as filter size yeah it uses odd numbers as filter size because we just discussed that if you choose uh, let's look at this uh, concept here if uh, remember padding is padding is where you are adding zeros to both sides okay to to the left hand side as well as to right hand side so it's always easy if you choose it as as an even number so padding should be even but padding depends the padding size depends on uh, the size of kernel because padding size uh, is nothing but uh, the size of kernel minus one right so if you choose your k kernel size as odd your p will be even and if your p is even you can distribute it uh, equally and properly without any problems nicely on both the sides. That's the whole idea. So let's go ahead where we were. Hope that answered the question. And so the, we were here. We'll, uh, we were here. I'll take the rest questions a little uh, later. Um, Right. So, so we were saying that okay, applying padding it would lead to it does not fit. So when when it does not fit, what we do is we apply padding. So that is why we uh, use the uh, idea of padding by adding one more layer of zero. We do not add information, uh, any new information, but uh, we, we we are able to use. The, the, the filter kernel so that's why padding is uh, very useful right so now you can see that it easily fits into the image and it leads to uh, the corresponding output okay well we have advanced a lot uh, we have got uh, we have got uh, very far uh, we have got um, um, we have advanced at pretty good rate and we have covered basic concepts. So let's look at the same procedure for multi input and output channels. So in case of multi input and output channels, what is happening? For the color images, we have three channels. Right? We have three channels. For grayscale images, we have one channel, and for colorful images, we have three channels. Now, what this three channels means is that we have, have three by H by uh, W sized image. So we have height, we have width uh, multiplied by three. So in fact, it's a it's an array of three matrices. So we have the uh, height and width of first matrix, height and width of second matrix, and height and width of third, uh, third matrix. So there are three channels basically. So it's a 2D kernel, uh, three images of uh, three images of, uh, of, of of 
of two of 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 of, uh, of two dimension. So what we are going to do is something very similar. Before we constructed a filter for uh, each image, um, each each matrix. Now we are going to construct filter for each channel. So red channel, green channel, blue channel. We are going to construct filter for each. Uh, channel, but each filter with respect to a specific feature. Okay, each filter. Let's say this filter. Uh, the objective would be to understand only the rectangular shape. For this feature, the idea would be to understand only a circular shape. For example, so each filter is trying to understand one typical feature, but for each of the channels. So let's do that. Let's just see how convolution works here. In uh, multi -ch multi input channel. So for multi input channel, we have uh, filter one leads to feature map one. Filter two, uh, uh, filter one, first channel leads to feature map. Second channel leads to another feature map. Third channel leads to another feature map. Right, and when you and we take the weighted sum, we take the sum of all these feature maps with respect to channel one, uh, filter one, and we get the feature map with respect to filter one. Similarly, we will do this with the second filter, a uh, third filter, a fourth filter, and can be done with a bank of filters, and we will have a bank of outputs. Is that okay? So let's do that. So here you have the original image, 32 by 32, three channels, RGB, okay? And we have one filter of five by five and three channels. Why three channels? Because image has three channels. Now, if you do convolution, you will get minus five plus one, which is 28 by 28 uh, feature map of dimension one. Why one? Because as we saw, we will convolute three matrices by uh, three by three. For each channel, we will have one feature map, and then we will add all the three channels. So we will get one uh, uh, channel a feature map. Similarly, if you have another, uh, if you have another, um, if you have another uh, uh, filter. You will get another feature map of similar dimensions. But this feature map is different from the previous one because the previous feature map was with respect to blue kernel. And this feature map is with respect to green kernel. And if you have another fil uh, feature map, uh, filter, yellow, let's say, then uh, you will get another one. And let's say if you have four, then you are going to go. Uh, you are going to get four feature maps, one for each filter. So now you have a new image, which has a certain dimension. You have twenty-eight by twenty-eight, okay, which uh, but with four channels, with four, uh, with four, four different uh, images here. Right. So these are the basics of convolution neural network, and. So so far we have just learned how to convolute, uh, how to how to convolve, right? And now we know how to uh, generate the outputs. So now you clearly understand what is happening. We take a we take an image, we take a filter, we convolve it, and now we we have to pass it through the nonlinearity, through the threshold, through this activation function. So once we apply the nonlinearity, as we saw earlier, feature the activation function, the features they pass through activation functions. Um, uh, and and uh, somebody has raised a hand, but uh, uh, I would I would prefer that you ask question in the chat box. That way I can respond to them. So and they pass through, uh, then we pass through the threshold. And then, well, 
if my filter uh, my filter will learn the weight of the filter will learn right will learn the weights using back propagation so now in practice what we do in deep uh, neural networks we use uh, uh, rectified linear units relu function very often as the activation function between different layers because it has fast convergence and zero uh, no zero gradient problem vanishing gradient problem as we discussed in the last lecture so let's now talk, let's now see this working. Uh, let's see, uh, let's, let's continue the last example that we saw. So we have the image, we have the filters. Let's say we have four filters because we want to extract four different features. We do the convolution, convolution as we saw before, and we pass through the ReLU function. So convolution is, uh, convolution is done and we pass through the nonlinearity and we get four different uh we get four different feature map maps okay of reduced size so now this particular feature map can be treated as a new image okay so it can be treated as a new image with four channels now let's go again let's do the same let, but instead of using four filters here, let's use 10 filters of size five by five and four. Why four? Because this must match with the number of channels in the, in the image. 10 filters, this is your choice. You can have 10 filters or you can have hundreds of filters or you can have just one filter. That's your choice. That depends on what you think, how complicated or how diverse your data is and how many features it has. So let's do that. Once we do that, well, we get another reduced size image. So here the size is 28 minus 5, uh, 28 the image size, 5 the filter size, uh, plus 1. So that's 24. And since you have 10 filters, you will have 10 channels. Exactly like before, we can use 6 channels and six, six filters uh, uh, and uh, we can use six filters but we'll have to use 10 channels right and once we do that we will get a reduced size which would be 24 minus 5 plus 1 that's 20 but uh, with six channels why six channels because we use six filters and we will get another reduced image with a reduced feature map right uh, with six channels and that's how different layers of a deep uh, neural network is uh, uh, that's why that's how a deep uh, that's how different layers of a deep neural network especially in the uh, context of convolution neural network is constructed so So that's that's that that's how you build different layers. I hope um, uh, I hope you were able to understand the the rationale, the idea, and the basic functioning of uh, different layers of a deep neural network. Uh, so that was the idea here. So now taking it a little further. Okay, I think we are above time now, uh, Doctor Vijay. Uh, am I am I running out of time? Or shall I continue? Yeah, you can continue, shall I? However, this is the last session. Okay, so I'll continue for uh, for five more minutes, okay? Yeah. And then take the questions. Okay, so let's finish this part. So you have understood this whole mechanism. Uh, Oh, there's a question why ReLU is called non-linearity. That's a, that's a, that's, that's, well, it's, I mean, it's an activation function. It's a rectified linear unit. So, uh, I mean, there's a certain abuse of term there. We call it uh, non-linearity, but please remember that it is not, uh, it, it's, 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 although it's continuous, but it's not differentiable, I guess, at zero. Um, but uh, why is it 
linearity i'm not sure if it is called non linearity but all almost all activation functions are uh, all non linearity so and of course that function is non linear because it's 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 it's, it's partially linear it's piece wise linear but overall really non linear because it's zero before zero and at zero well uh, uh, is zero and if zero it's uh, equal to the value that's why hope that answered the question so we understood the basic functioning of uh, deep neural network now that's that's your deep neural network that is the that is what that is how we construct different layers of uh, convolution neural network and which is basically nothing but remember these filters these filters they are just the weights so you have some matrix matrix of weights so basically it's it's a uh, matrix product uh, between weights of the filters and the image data so you are performing um, you are performing exactly the same operations you are multiplying and taking sum of the results and that's what in what you see in yellow is is what is happening it's um, it's, 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 it's it's a matrix multiplication followed by nonlinearity but what is very important very interesting to understand is that you are given a large image and through successive layers you are able to extract useful features and at the same time you are also able to reduce the dimensions of the feature uh, of the image so you are successively first you have 32 size 32 by 32 then you are 28 by 28 24 by 24 20 by 20 so you are uh you are um uh but you are getting the most useful information and at the same time you are also reducing the amount of information and that's very good so what we do some remarks here we observe the reduction size as we just discussed uh each feature map it learns the features in hierarchical sense okay and covnet uh in covnet what we do is we learn the filter weights remember we don't know the exact weights of the filter we will learn successively and bias as well and how do we learn we learn using back propagation the uh, which we which we saw in the previous lecture we saw in the previous lecture back propagation so that's how we are going to learn and um, well uh, well that's it uh, uh, we have each neuron is a hidden layer we take the inputs You know, while sliding, we compute the weighted sum, apply the bias, apply non-linear activation, and we do that for each filter at each stage. And we, uh, once this is done, we back propagate the error in each of the layers, in each of these filter layers, and we adapt or modify the weights. And through successive training, we will tune, we will adapt the weights, we will modify the weights of each filter, and uh, after. Uh, this will sufficient training uh, we will um, uh, we will uh, uh, be able to obtain the optimal set of weights for uh, for uh, so let's stop here and tomorrow we will uh, in uh, on friday i think on thursday i think we have the last uh, we will continue Yes, and we can also talk about some practical aspects of. Uh, I can perhaps I, if if we have some time, I can we I can show you um, some 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 examples. I'll try to. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I I I'm not sure, but I can try to do that. But, uh, yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's been a pleasure uh, talking to all of you and presenting this to all of you. um so let vijay shall we stop here is that okay
Yeah. So um, uh, there are some questions. What is the meaning of channel? Uh, what is the meaning of channel and what is the importance of channel in this context? Well, the channels are, we talked about uh, channels, um, one for each layer, uh, one for each color. So a colorful image has three channels, RGB, red, green, and blue. The channels are basically... <laughs> Professor on the Great. So, do we have some questions? Do we have some questions? Uh, we can discuss one question. Do we have some comments or anything, Dr. Vijay? Um, I'm done. Side, I think. Sir, I, have one, I have one question regarding this uh, final result when we do the summation after applying filters. So if we suppose we are mm -hmm. taking three filters for three different features, suppose one curve, one cone and one straight line. Sure. Yeah. So then after doing this feature, we all sum them up together. So what do we get out of this? After summation, what do we get? Yes, that's a very nice question. So what do we get? Uh -huh. What we get is at each stage, we are, get, we are getting the weighted sum. What is a weighted sum? A weighted sum is a combination of, of, of the features, right? But it's a weighted sum. So it depends on how important that feature is at that particular stage, at that particular layer. So let's say you're uh, you're you're trying to understand um, you're trying to understand. Uh, let's say the sh let's say you're trying to identify um, a ground, a football ground from the image of uh, from the image of uh, let's say uh, from an uh, top top view image or from some aircraft so you are going to look for only circular shapes now you can use first filter with rectangular shape and you can employ three filters let's say so the first filter will un will extract some rectangular shapes the second filter will extract some um some 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 other shape and perhaps the third filter will extract circular shape because it it's 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 very prominent it's it's there you are interested only in circular shapes so you are going to put the output as a football ground and now when the back propagation happens it's going to modify those weights which have come from the the filter which captured the circular shape so you have a weighted sum and it is going to prioritize the circular shape over the other shapes and that's what it is i i hope that was clear it was a very nice explanation okay thank you so that um, i hope that's clear uh, but I mean that's that's how we do things. You have multivariate uh, entities. Uh, we take the weighted sum and we try to see how how much that particular feature has contributed in that weighted sum, and that's what it is at each layer. Do we have other questions? Okay, so I guess, uh, well, if you have other questions, you can always send me an email or write to me. Or, uh, uh, 
Well, I'll be happy to just address your problems. You can you can search me on LinkedIn or or or, uh, or just write to me, and there is no problem at all. Uh, I can link send you some links for the resources. So I'm very happy to uh, uh, to 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 discuss and to uh, discuss interesting uh, things. Uh, especially in these emerging domains. Now here, those of you who are not from computer science, who are from mechanical and other uh, domains from uh, electrical background or mechanical background, uh, please know that uh, these days, uh, these convolutional neural networks, they are also used for uh, feature extraction for, uh, um, so as auto encoders, uh, as feature extractors, as um, as uh, uh, as filters uh, for unsupervised learning, uh, I think one of the important points to highlight is that in robotics, these these uh, covnets are used for understanding the unknown uh, environment. So using images using uh, different sensors, uh, the environment is approximated or understood using uh, convolutional neural networks. And um, that leads to the design of control. So I can perhaps show you uh, an image where well, I don't have it here in this, but you will have it, you will see it in the first, uh, um, in the first lecture uh, where we talked about uh, applications of AI. So I started with a few examples. You'll see that I talked about deep reinforcement learning where the deep part is what uh, is uh, contributed by these networks. So in robotics, they're using a lot of deep learning in order to understand unknown state space, unknown environment. Uh, using it in self-driving cars and there's this uh, how to decide number of filters in each stage i cannot tell you um, uh, precisely depends on depends on the complexity of data and uh, can i apply edge detection yes you can uh, apply edge detection to mona lisa picture you can apply edge detection to any picture you also have uh, eyebrows, so you can apply his detection to you. So that will be fine. Okay, let's let's end our session here, Doctor Vijay. Yeah, ma'am. Okay, so in the last lecture, I will for information, I will complete this. Part. We have a few other concepts to to discuss, and I will present the basic Alex uh, net and the AlexNet, and perhaps that would be sufficient to get started uh, in this domain. And then I can show some practical aspects and that should, I guess, serve the purpose that we have here, the online uh, program. And uh, all of you are coming from different parts of the country. Yeah. So that's an amazing opportunity to, um, to exchange, to interact with different uh, people. Okay, so have good food. Oh, it's evening right there. Here it's afternoon, I'm going to have food. And uh, have a good evening, everyone. Yeah. So Dr. Vijay, uh, see you soon. After day after yeah, yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, thank you, man. Really, without you, this MDP was uh, uh, means, uh, the success behind this MDP is because of you. <laughs> I'm, happy <to> know that. <laughs> I'm happy to know that. Very happy. It's my pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pleasure to, uh, to 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 be part of this. It's a great initiative by uh, your university by you and by the government of India, uh, which is very good because uh, these are emerging domains. Um, these are emerging domains uh, and uh, 
I, this research field is, uh, is 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 advancing so so rapidly that it's it's very hard to to be actually be saying that oh I know everything no no one knows everything no one is uh, up to date because it's advancing so fast and so to have such a kind of program is very beneficial uh, for teachers for students for faculty members uh, everyone so it's it's a great opportunity yeah and yeah. hoping to see um, new and uh, new and more and more people uh, will use ai for in mechanical engineering or in electrical engineering um, in control engineering uh, that would be great because in um, in, in four or five years, we are going to see, um, I mean, already we are seeing in four or five years, I think this will also mature as a, as a, um, uh, we can be seeing AI based degrees like mechanical engineering, we can have artificial engineering degree yeah. in universities next five years or six years. So that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's a very high problem. Some institute already has, has started I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's right. That's right. I'm aware of Super IT Hyderabad, I guess, that has uh, uh, a degree program there, if I'm correct. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Okay. Thank you. See you. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Now, is there anyone to give feedback about this FDP regarding the conduction of this FDP? Sir, I am Ashok Kumar, Smooth Engineering College. Okay. Hello.